Hi, I'm Helen Ann Curry. I'm a university senior lecturer based in the Department of History and Philosophy of Science at the University of Cambridge. I'm a historian of modern science and technology with a particular interest in recent, even current day, histories of food, agriculture, and the environment. The research that I'm doing right now looks at the history of efforts to conserve genetically diverse varieties of agricultural crops. Since the start of the 20th century, and especially since the 1970s, scientists, farmers, and many other people have worried about the possibility that diverse, traditional, local crop varieties might be disappearing. In many places, these have been or are being replaced by more widely grown and often more genetically uniform commercial varieties. This scenario, in which many diverse old types are replaced by a few industrial crops, provokes different worries among different people. Professional plant breeders and other researchers have long worried that as a result of this transition, they won't have access to some of the basic starting materials that they need to breed crop varieties of the future. Propelled by this concern, scientists, typically relying on the support of national governments, started developing seed collections in the first half of the 20th century. Those collections eventually transitioned into the secure seed storage facilities that we know today as seed banks or gene banks. A prominent example of such a seed bank is the Svalbard Global Seed Vault. You may have heard about this from reports in the news. The seed vault is a backup collection. It stores copies or duplicates of many national and international crop seed collections from around the world in a facility that lies below the Arctic permafrost. This doomsday vault, as it's often called, is thought to keep these seeds, which scientists and breeders regard as precious genetic resources, safe from the turmoil of wars or the threat of natural disasters. The Svalbard Global Seed Vault is simply the most famous example of a seed bank today. There are, in fact, an estimated 1,700 different seed banks around the world, which together contain some 7 million individual deposits of seed. Impressive as this tally is, it represents only one response to the potential loss of crop diversity. As I said at the outset of the talk, different groups have responded to this concern in different ways. In a recent set of studies, I've looked into how home and allotment gardeners have historically responded to this idea that crop diversity might be endangered. Where professional breeders worried about the loss of potential options in the distant future, Many gardeners were concerned about the very next season. They wanted to ensure that they would have access to their favorite varieties, even as seed companies focused on industrial growers and national regulations restricted seed sales to approved types. Here in Britain, the author and gardener Lawrence Hills was among the first to rally home and allotment gardeners to the cause of crop variety conservation. Hills was especially concerned about the possibilities of losing the vegetables that small-scale cultivators liked. Ones that tasted good, that tolerated local pests, or that didn't need expensive inputs. At the time that he first became aware of the potential for the loss of crop diversity to be a widespread phenomenon, sometime around 1970, Hills was already a leading garden authority in Britain. He was a book author, a newspaper columnist, and also the founder and head of the Henry Doubleday Research Association. This association was a charity established by Hills, which aimed to organize experiments in organic and other alternative agricultural methods. Things like green manuring, non-chemical pest control, and the like. Many of you will know this organization as today's Garden Organic. In the 1970s, in letters to the editor and through established channels of the Henry Doubleday Research Association, Lawrence Hills launched a campaign to save endangered vegetable varieties. He called for gardeners to contribute seeds of rare or outstanding varieties to a growing collection, establishing the basis for what would eventually become the Heritage Seed Library. Many gardeners tuned into this talk might already know about the Heritage Seed Library, as it's still active today as part of Garden Organic's many activities. 
but they might not realize that this was just one of many ideas that Hills and those he worked with had for saving vegetable varieties from extinction. And it wasn't even the one they initially planned on working. In fact, at the start, Hills saw banking on the state model as the best intervention. Hills contributed to the early stages of advocacy for a UK vegetable gene bank. This is where he first imagined sending the special seeds he'd solicited from growers. However, this gene bank, which required a lot of funds, was slow to get off the ground. In the meantime, the Henry Doubleday Research Association staff assembled two publications, The Vegetable Finder and The Fruit Finder. Published in the late 1970s, these documents listed the best seeds for sale and where to get them, with the idea that keeping good seeds in steady demand was a way to keep them in circulation and to keep them accessible to future gardeners. The UK Vegetable Gene Bank was eventually established in 1980 as part of the existing National Vegetable Research Station at Wellsburn. But its development was, as this timeline suggests, slow. And in the interim, it became clear that it would be primarily for professionals, potentially leaving some home growers out in the cold with respect to accessing seeds. That's when the vision for a seed library really started to take shape at the Henry Doubleday Research Association in conjunction with encouraging home growers to become seed savers and inviting volunteer seed guardians to assist with ensuring that the seed library would always have seeds to circulate. Whereas this seed library is still thriving, as well as the UK Vegetable Gene Bank, another one of Hills's ideas didn't gain quite as much traction. Around 1980, he attempted to launch a network of what he called vegetable sanctuaries. These would be gardens at stately homes or other sites open to the public. These sanctuaries would grow and display heritage vegetable varieties as a way of both perpetuating them and educating visitors about the importance of vegetable conservation. Just like a wildlife sanctuary, these protected spaces would ensure that rare and endangered types survived for future generations to enjoy. Although the vegetable sanctuary movement appears to have failed, only a few were established and the concept didn't catch on in the way Hills hoped, there is a case to be made that Hills and his colleagues, and like-minded activists in Britain and beyond, succeeded in creating vast numbers of these sanctuaries. That's because the heritage and heirloom vegetable movement of the 1970s survives today, in many cases adapted to the interests of new groups, including immigrants, for example, and young farmers. The advocacy campaigns that started 50 years ago, which championed seed libraries, exchange networks, and other grassroots action, convinced many growers that their own gardens could and should be vegetable sanctuaries. So the history of these campaigns are as important to recover as those of national and international conservation projects since they, too, have shaped the landscapes of conservation in profound ways. If you're interested in learning more about this story, other histories of vegetable conservation, or the history of seed banking, I encourage you to take a look at my website, where you can access the publication on which this talk is based and many others besides. Thanks for your time, and I hope you enjoy this Festival of Plants.